evolution works on populations. And so if we study population genetics, we can understand something about evolution <clears throat> in populations. Um, Hardy and Weinberg uh, developed a model to help uh, explain how LL frequencies remain constant within populations. <clears throat> and this is a very useful tool for forensic applications and also for the study of uh, evolutionary change. And what the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium says is that the genotypes of the populations are in equilibrium. Um, there are some assumptions here, and that is that you have a large randomly mating population with no other forces um, in effect. And of course, if we look at uh, large scales of time, uh, that kind of falls apart. But for short scales of time, it's very, very useful. Um, what the equilibrium says is that dominant alleles do not replace the recessive alleles. In other words, the frequencies of the different alleles remain constant within the population. So the original proportions of the genotype remain constant. The mathematical basis for the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is a binomial expansion. And the binomial expansion of uh, P plus Q uh, squared is equal to, of course, um, P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared where P is the dominant allele, <clears throat> and remember in convention we use an uppercase letter to represent a dominant allele, and Q is the recessive allele, and we use a lowercase letter to represent the recessive allele. So if we look at a simple example of uh, the wool and sheep, and we know we have uh, white wool and sheep, and we have black wool and sheep, and if we use a, a simple total population number of 100, and we have 84 uh, white sheep and 16 black sheep, the white sheep could be either homozygous dominant, uh, big W, big W, or they could be heterozygous uh, with the big W, little w, and that would both give us white sheep. However, the black sheep would be homozygous recessive, uh, little w, little w. Uh, so, if we uh, plug these values into the Hardy-Weinberg <coughs> equation, what we find is, uh, and, and this is the, usually the simplest way to look at these types of problems, is to find the frequency of the homozygous recessive individual. So the homozygous recessive uh, black wool sheep, in this case, are 16. So out of 100, that would be 0.16 would be the frequency. And that would represent Q squared, because that's little w, little w. So if we take the square root of that, we could find Q, and so Q would be 0.4. And then we know that uh, the white or black wool color have to represent 100% of the total variation. So we know that <clears throat> this relationship, uh, P plus Q, has to equal 100% of variation, or has to equal 1. And so in this particular case, if we have the frequency of Q, then 1 minus 0.4 can give us the frequency of P. And so we know the frequency of P would be 0.6 in this particular case, and that would be the frequency of big W allele, or that, that dominant allele. And then we can go on and we can use the rest of the expressions for the uh, equation, and we can determine the heterozygous frequencies. So 2 times P times Q would give us 0.48 and then the frequency of the homozygous dominant would be <clears throat> p squared, so 0.16 squared would give us 0.36. Now, what the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium says is that the frequencies of uh, p and q, uh, p and q are going to remain constant in the population as long as you have randomly mating individuals and no other forces at play. And so it wouldn't matter how many heterozygous individuals there were. There could be more homozygous uh, recessive individuals, but the overall frequency of P and Q is going to remain constant. And this is useful for forensic applications um, in that we can look at uh, the different uh, frequencies in the human genome, and we can uh, know that these frequencies aren't going to change in our lifetimes, because our lifetimes are so long, and so we can actually look at these frequencies within populations, and we can look at a number of these different 
uh, locuses on the genome and we can come up with uh, very uh, slim probabilities that anybody, any two people would actually have the same type of gene frequencies and this is part of the basis for DNA fingerprinting. So in evolutionary terms, um, there are factors that affect the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and <clears throat> these factors are things like mutations, migration, genetic drift, non-random mating, and then selection. And selection uh, is the one that will lead to evolutionary change. And so in other words, these are things that would change the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium so that we didn't have uh, gene frequencies that remained constant. They would actually change, and this would be microevolution, which could eventually lead to macroevolution. So mutations, of course, are you know any change in the allele uh, in the organism, and so these could be deletions, duplications, translocations, and any of those are types of mutations. So it alters the proportions of alleles in the population. It's generally a very slow process. Uh, mutations don't occur very frequently. They usually occur in a few individuals, and then that gene, if it's favorable in the environment, it could be selected for possibly. Uh, migration is immigration and emigration, so into populations or out of populations. And in a lot of uh, planktonic forms, oceanic uh, creatures, aquatic organisms, you have larval stages that uh, drift with the currents. And this, of course, can uh, lead to changes in populations because as these uh, new genes flow into populations or out of populations, it can change the gene frequencies. And this brings up a couple other uh, words that uh, you should be familiar with. In the gene pool are all the alleles present in the population. And gene flow is when these uh, alleles move from one population to another. Um, genetic drift can alter the Hardy-Weinberg uh, equilibrium, and this can occur in a, a few different types of ways. It's thought to have probably played a role in human evolution, and these are just random chance events that can change the gene frequencies. <clears throat> uh, one uh, way this can happen, it's called the founder principle, and this is where you have a small group of individuals, a subset of the population, uh, buds off from, migrates away from the original population and within that small group uh, there are certain alleles that may have been uncommon in the source population but now in their new population they become very very uh, common. Uh, one uh, example that you might think about are, are uh, the people in Ireland originally you had a lot of red-haired blue-eyed blue people in that part of the world on that little island and so one of the ideas of the founder effect is you, you have a small group of individuals that originally got there where these alleles, which are fairly uncommon in the rest of the population, were more common. And so you go on to um, build a population now that makes these alleles uh, more frequent. And this is very common in oceanic islands uh, where you have small number of individuals, whether it be tortoises or iguanas or birds, um, or human beings that get to these islands and they have certain characteristics which may not have been very common in the source population but now all of a sudden these are going to be um, dominant alleles within the new population. A another uh, force here that leads to this uh, genetic drift is something that's uh, analogous to a, a bottle and pouring marbles out of a bottle and that only so many would actually escape the bottle, the rest of them might stay in there. <clears throat> and what this means is that you have a limited number of alleles that survive. Um, so one of the ideas here uh, in human population is, you know, the bubonic plague in Europe, the Black Death, may have acted as a bottleneck in a way, and uh, many, uh, you know, individuals died, whatever gene frequencies they were carrying, those you know, may have been completely disappeared, and so you, you left with a population that have uh, certain characteristics. Uh, the big cats are another example of this bottleneck effect. <clears throat> in, in the case of cheetahs in particular, we, we look at their genome and it turns out that uh, almost all the individuals are very, very similar, and it's thought that they went through some type of um, 
feline AIDS epidemic at one point in their past that decimated the populations, but those that survived have gone on to found the new population, so it was a bottleneck that actually limited that population. All right, non-random mating uh, implies that uh, we, we don't have random mating, and if you look at human populations, you know that's true. Uh, selective forces are at play. If you look at bird populations, you know that's true. Uh, female birds are selecting for uh, their mates. Um, certain individuals uh, mate more commonly than others. Um, sometimes this can lead to inbreeding, um, and inbreeding is when you have an increase in proportion of hetero or homozygous individuals within the population because it's going to concentrate those um, double recessive um, you know, alleles uh, in the individuals. And we know that this can lead to uh, genetic disorders because many just genetic disorders are recessive traits and they only exhibit themselves in the homozygous recessive condition. Uh, this can also lead to pedigree collapse where you uh, have fewer ancestors in the pedigree of the organism, so less genetic diversity, in other words. Um, and sexual selection um, is, of course, a, a form of non-random mating. Outcrossing could even be a form of non-random mating because in random mating you would have equal probability of, uh, of inbreeding as well as outcrossing. So in uh, the case of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, if you don't have completely random mating, then the gene frequencies can very well change. And that's what they would do if you have inbreeding or sexual selection or outcrossing all the time. Uh, selection, or natural selection, is the only force that causes evolutionary change. And all the other uh, violations of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium would imply that some type of environmental effect would uh, select eventually for individuals that would be more, most fit for the oceanic island or for being selected or for surviving disease, um, for migrating. <clears throat> there are a couple types. Uh, artificial selection, we know that a human being can select for traits that are desirable. So if we want fat pigs, we breed more fat pigs together and we get fat pigs. If we want fast racing horses, we, we breed together two fast racing horses. And we know we can uh, artificially create um, a great number of variations. Um, natural selection is when the environment uh, selects for those individuals that are most fit and those characteristics are passed on to the next uh, generation or descent with modification. Um, so selection really only acts directly on the phenotype, so there's still that underlying genotype that it uh, may not be uh, selecting for, and when I say phenotype, these could be metabolic processes that maybe you, you don't visually see, but nonetheless that's part of the phenotype of the individual. Uh, but the underlying recessive alleles may not be selected against. So the limits of selection are alternative alleles may interact with each other. Um, we know that that's true in coat color. We know that that's true in the speed of racing horses. Uh, only expressed characters interact with the environment. And so in other words, only the phenotype interacts with the environment. Um, it, it doesn't really interact with the rare recessive alleles. Those can remain within the population and not be affected by selection. So selection against undesirable traits um, is difficult. And this is something that uh, in Darwin's time they didn't quite understand. It was, you know, kind of thought that if you had undesirable traits, if the environment was selecting for those that were most fit, then undesirable traits would disappear. Well, that wasn't the case. Uh, but in the late 1800s, uh, Darwin and his contemporaries didn't know anything about uh, genetics and uh, how the gene frequencies uh, actually worked, so they weren't quite able to explain this. Uh, but they, they knew that it did happen. They knew that undesirable traits still appeared within populations. So there are limits to the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. However, it is useful for studying population genetics. <laughs>